a great intro. I I love to see Matt Patrick's Wonk Press at right there with his two great books. I do too. <laughs> a lot of people are getting those books right now. There's a lot of excitement in the world right now. Yeah, so we're very, uh, well, very grateful for that. Uh, really quickly, my name is Federico Hernandez from Savvy.co. Uh, super excited to be here. Uh, really quickly, uh, we are. I'm going to do a quick intro and then let you guys with the uh, with the great host and his guest. Um, if you're visiting us at Savvy.co or you're watching us through LinkedIn, YouTube, Facebook, whichever platform it is, come over to Zavi, which is Z-A-V-V-Y dot C-O, and you can participate from our uh, live stream where you'll see to the right, you have ask questions or comments. You have a chat box too, where we already have a lot of people starting to write, which is great. And we have some members from Worspa. We have Terry, Jerry, D Diane. Well, 51 people from around the world already connected, which is phenomenal. If you have any questions in the bottom, it says ask questions that during the live stream, your host, Matt Patrick, will be uh, choosing questions to uh, ask his uh, guest. And, um, and that's basically it. Enjoy, have fun, and I leave you guys in good hands. Well, have thank you, Betty. Uh, a pleasure to be here again. Uh, for those people um, who – actually – Many, many of you have, have watched these, these uh, videos before, but for those who have not, uh, just a little bit of background. Um, we, the, these are a series of videos we at the West Indies Rum and Spirits Producers Association, it's a mouthful, uh, better known as Worspa. Uh, there, our 50th anniversary was in 2021, and so we started a series of videos uh, uh, to interview some of the icons of Caribbean rum, people who've worked in the industry for decades, and I have played an instrumental role in making rum what it is today. And we're very honored today to have Mr. Jerry Edwards, uh, formerly of the of Mountain Gay Distilleries, a, the master blender uh, for many years, has created many, many of our iconic uh, Mount Gay expressions. So welcome, Jerry. Thank you. Thank you, Matt. Yes. So uh, let's jump right in. Um, so tell us about your life before joining the rum industry and you know what were you doing where did you grow up and what prepared you to work in the rum industry well to begin with i spent all my life in barbados uh the only parts of my life that i spent outside of barbados was in business travel or on vacations to far and distant places but uh i attended the university of the west indies where I did a degree in chemistry and mathematics. It was a double major. And uh, how that led me into rum was, was quite interesting because uh, I, I had no thought of being in the rum industry to begin with. Uh, for a start, when I graduated from the university, I thought that, that I'd go into teaching because uh, chemistry and mathematics were my, 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 my strengths. And I thought I, I would start there and then look further afield. Uh, at the same time, though, I had the thought of if I were going to be doing any postgraduate work, it would be in the field of uh, reaction kinetics. I, I thought of uh, being a kineticist because when I was at university studying chemistry, I had a Dr. Webb who was himself a kineticist, a spectroscopist, and, um, and I had been doing some research with him uh, after the end of my final year, during the time when other students went off on vacation, I spent time with him doing research on the ninhydrin reaction, and it was uh, uh, to do with uh, reaction kinetics of the ninhydrin reaction. Uh, so, uh, but how I eventually got into to, uh, to be working at Mount Gay, I didn't study anything to do with rum. Uh, we didn't do any kind of rum chemistry at the university. Uh, the closest thing would have been in organic chemistry, uh, understanding the, the reactions that take place uh, that, that will cause the formation of, of, of alcohol from, from esters, things of that nature, but no real focus on, on alcohol really, and no, no real focus on rum. Uh, but Mount Gay, I, so I applied for a teaching job, as I started saying, and uh, the day I got a call from, from a local college called Harrison College, secondary school, uh, to teach chemistry uh, there, I also received a call from Mount Gay Distilleries Limited to come for uh, an interview. They asked me if I was interested, and they said, yes, I'd come for the interview. And they told me, well, they had been recommended by my organic chemistry professor who 
had told them that I was the, the leading student when it came to organic chemistry, especially in the in the in labs. Um, my labs were were quite good. So he thought that it would be good for Mount Gay because they were looking for um, a quality control chemist. So I went for the interview and I was successful in the interview. In the interview. Um, Harrison College called me again and I told him, well, I was going to go into the industry, the rum industry. So uh, I prefer to be using my, chem my, my, my studies in practical application rather than, than teach at that point. So that started my career at Mount Gay as a quality control chemist. Excellent. So uh, I've, I've noticed this over and over as I talk to the many uh, Peruvian master blenders. Uh, oftentimes they come into the industry by way of quality control and have a strong, strong background in chemistry. And, yes. and, and you're, you're one of many who, who, who have that story behind them. So uh, what was your, you mentioned quality control. So tell us more about your initial role at Mount Gay. Um, what were, what was, what was your like first couple of months like, what were you doing there? Well, my first couple of months were rudimentary and quite boring, I have to say, because all I was doing is kind, kind of bench top chemistry, um, uh, simple tests uh, that I was doing. And as a matter of fact, when I joined the company, they had a, a young man who was, I think, about my same age, who had been holding on in the chemistry lab until I got there. And that young man turned out to be Frank Ward, who later became Dr. Frank Ward. And so Frank Ward put me through the ropes of what it was like to be doing um, the quality control role at Montgay. And so after a few months of doing that, I uh, went and spoke to Darnley Ward, who was the managing director of the company at the time, patriarch of the company. And I explained to him that I, I found the role quite boring just to be doing bench chemistry. And that while it was, uh, it had some degree of interest, it was not enough to sustain my my, my interests. Um, and so I asked him if he would mind if I would elaborate the systems at Monge a bit more and move it from, from quality control to quality assurance because they had started doing lots of reading on what quality assurance was all about and statistical quality control and he said yeah sure go ahead young man you 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 try your best and see what you can do to, to improve things so said so done i um, started to put systems in place to um to embrace the whole idea and to, to execute quality control a quality assurance program but what that required then is to have additional staff to support that kind of work because uh, the distinction that we, we we should make between quality control and quality assurance is that quality control simply checks on what has been done and very often that leads to an increased costs because sometimes if you didn't get it right the first time you have to do some rework and uh, rework is additional cost of manpower and materials uh, whereas quality assurance follows the progress of production from beginning to end. So what that meant was instead of, of our just um, taking uh, rum from the barrels and putting it into, into, into vats, we had wooden vats at the time, and making the product and then testing it only to find out that something was wrong. We started taking uh, samples of alcohol from the distillery in St. Lucie first, which was not part of Monge. Um, yeah, we'll come back to that in a, in a later question. Yeah. Uh, so, so, so we started to check then everything from the beginning, uh, which was uh, even the fermentation, all the way through to the end product, the aging and the bottling, packaging, the labeling, how it you know was applied. And so that's where where quality control became a, a really good and beneficial thing for Monge distilleries back in those days. Right. Uh, and you mentioned uh, Darnley Ward and uh, Frank Ward, who also is a friend of mine and who has also appeared on the Icon series. Uh, can you walk us just briefly through all the, the many Ward family members? Because at the time, Mount Gay was owned, or the aspects of Mount Gay were owned by the Ward family. So walk us through those transitions over the years. So when I joined the company in 2018, uh, sorry, 1980, what am I saying? In 1980, 
uh, at that time, the rum refinery of Mount Gay was being uh, run by Mr. Lyle Ward. Lyle Ward uh, was Darnley Ward's brother. So Lyle was in charge of the rum refinery of Mount Gay Limited, a separate company, separate and distinct entity. And uh, Darnley Ward was in charge of the of Mount Gay Distilleries Limited. So whereas the rum refinery of Mount Gay did the distillation, the fermentation and distillation, uh, Mount Gay Distilleries Limited was responsible for the manufacture and marketing of the of the end product. Uh, Lyle Ward was succeeded by Louis Ward after he passed away. And th then Louis was succeeded by Kyle Ward, if my memory serves me correctly, uh, a young man at the time. And uh, then following Kyle was uh, Carl Ward. And then I think Frank then subsequently took over uh, 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 from Carl Ward. So this was all at the Rum Refinery of Mount Gay Limited. On the Mount Gay Distillery side, as I said before, when I joined the company, we had Darnley Ward. And at the time when I joined the company, the company was changing hands because the company shareholders were sh sh selling 60% uh, of their shares to a, a, a U.S. company called Formos McKesson. Formos McKesson was mostly into pharmaceuticals, as I recall, and mineral waters. They hadn't had a lot of experience uh, in the field of distilled spirits at all but at that time uh, they had already got in a bit to the to the liquor industry because they had they had mohawk liquor corporation in um in detroit michigan they also had a company in italy in Solara, Italy, I've forgotten its, its name now, but they, they used to produce Galliano, they produced Galliano, uh, wow. which is very, very famous, uh, well-known uh, liqueur. Uh, they also owned a distribution company in, I think it was in New, New York at the time, called 21 Brands. Um, so they had made their, their, their step into the field of spirits uh, around the same time that they bought Mount Gay Distilleries Limited. Um, but they brought with them uh, some interesting aspects. And uh, actually, they brought their own managing director uh, who was recruited from the Bahamas, a Barbadian who had served as a police officer in the Bahamas for many years and then who got into the liquor business as a salesman. And they thought that it would be good to have a Barbadian recruited to run Mongay Distilleries as the as the managing director when when Dar Darnley Ward retired. Um, I'm, I, I'm sorry, I do not remember his name right now, but uh, but he ran the company for a few years and then he resigned. And we've had a number of local managing directors uh, since then, one of them uh, having been uh, previously the managing director of Courtesy Garage Limited, uh, Robert Evelyn. And then he was succeeded by um, Peter Marshall. Uh, um, so after Peter Marshall, then during the time of Peter Marshall was when the company changed hands because then the Remy, Remy Martin, as it was called at the time, uh, had bought the called controlling interests of the company from the McKesson Corporation. So they took ownership of the company. And with that, they brought a whole new way of looking at things because the, the US company was not interested in aged rum. Their main thing was on, on younger rum because they, they had no, no sense of the value of matured, mat, uh, matured rum or the process of maturation. For them, it was money wasted. To, to put money in inventory for so long a period of time. Okay, so yeah, um, yeah, you, you've outlined a whole lot of, of interesting history there, and I, I've written a little bit about it. Uh, let me see if I can briefly recap it, and you you tell me if I if what I what I got right or wrong. Um, my understanding is that it was back in the 1920s that due to the Barbados laws that the distilleries couldn't sell directly, you needed a separate company. 
Uh, and so, you know, the sort of confusingly named Mountain Gay Distilleries was not actually a distillery. Uh, the actual distillery was the rum refinery of Mount Gay, but still owned by, essentially owned by the uh, various members of the Ward family and, and other shareholders for many years. And then in 1980, uh, foremost McKesson bought the Mount Gay distilleries, meaning the, the bottling, bottling and, and the brand, if you will, but the Ward family still maintained controlling interest in the rum refinery of Mount Gay. Um, and that lasted for many years. Um, uh, and in 1989, Foremost sold their rum re or sold their Mountain Gay distilleries to uh, to Remy Remy Martin at the time. But again, the the Ward family retained the ownership uh, of Mountain Gay distillery. I'm sorry, rum refinery Mountain Gay retained yes. distillery ownership running uh, until 2013 or so. Is that is that basically? That's, a, it. That's it. That's it. That's correct. Excellent. Okay. Because yeah, I know I know it's confusing, and and I know Frank Ward has had to ex explain it to me many times. So I finally, I think I'm, I'm getting the hang of it. So um, when you joined, you joined in 1980. Were there any particularly uh, particular blending projects you got to work early on, uh, or got to work on early? Yes, uh, just just one. I think that old Darnley Ward was trying to test my ability because I had been brought on, as I said before, to do just quality control bench top chemistry. And he thought he would throw down a challenge to me. So he called me to his office one day and he said, Sonny, I'd like you to simulate a rum that is sold in the Northern, made by a company in the Northern Caribbean, in fact, in Bermuda. And, he's, and he gave me a sample of the product and he said, I would like you to match this, this product for us. And I said, okay, I'll give it a try. And this, at that time, I had no idea of what blending was about because remember, up to that point, I had not been involved in the in the blending either. I was just taking samples and testing them, right? But I was not actually doing any blending uh, because at that time we had a, a master blender. His name was McDonald Chemistry, uh, McDonald Jessamy, and so he was doing his own thing, and I was just taking samples and testing them. But here it is, Darnley Ward threw down this challenge, and I I took it up. Um, and I went about the blending project at the time, and, and at the time it was a rum called Gosling's. I'm not even so sure if it still exists, but it was Gosling's. Gosling's is still around. Yes, it was Gosling's. Yeah. Um, so I went to the lab, and I found a way to get different materials to put the cakes together. I smelled and, and tasted, and sort of identified the different characteristics and, and found flavors that would match what we were looking for. And I put it together and I went to him about two weeks later and he said, this is what I've got. And he compared the two and he said, this is a perfect match, a perfect match. I said, okay, so what would you like me to do from here on now? He said, well, nothing. I just wanted to see if you could do it. <laughs> <laughs> so did you have, so, be, so obviously there was a chemistry aspect to that, but did you have any prior sort of training with the prior <laughs> uh mm -hmm. in terms of like sensory analysis or anything or none you know none what, no, no, no none whatsoever it all had to come just naturally <laughs> okay excellent mm -hmm. so so that's a nice segue into the next question which is um how long were you there before you sort of stepped into the master blender role or tell us about how long and and what was that process like of becoming the master blender so um after a year of being there, and this is after the whole Gosling's experiment, uh, it was thought that I should get more intimately involved in what was going on in the blending operation. Uh, so I did. Um, and at that time, the master blender, McDonald Jessamy, I was working with ratios that were handed to him by uh, the production manager. Uh, so he, he he was putting it together, but he was not the creator of the of the formula, but, but he was just putting it together. And so I thought it would be good to bring a bit more science to the way things were done. And so from that point, what I did was to to create the, the formulae, the various formula, formulae uh, based on percentages rather than ratios. I mean, they they ultimately are the same thing, but 
but uh, it found it much easier to work with percentages. And so I, I taught the master blender, who was not particularly good at mathematics at the time. I taught him a few a few things on how to, how to work these these percentages and even the ratios and how for any size batch how to calculate how much of the various ingredients he needed to to put together to to make a batch because uh he had not been doing much of that to begin with much of what he was doing was not formulation but just blending and taking the ingredients and putting them together so uh so when when the company realized that i had been doing this with mcdonald jesse uh they got me to, to be working more closely with him over the years i was not the master blender but i was working closely with the master blender to 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 put more science into the way that things were were done uh, what that also meant too is that by that time we had elaborated the system of quality assurance uh, which means that we were we were doing end-to-end -end checks on all the material all the various materials as well as the the intermediate products and the finished product and so what that also meant was the master blender was then involved in looking at what the, what uh in different ages of rum he was using uh, how he would be combining those to create the kind of character that we wanted in the finished product and so because you're we working that closely and because we were discovering ways of doing things to ensure that there was consistency in the in the in the product and because for the first time uh, we were coming to understand the difference between age and maturity age being simply the length of time that the rum sits in the barrel and maturity being the quality that achieves over time uh, that we were able to, to realize that really we, we ought not to we should should really stay around from stating and putting an age statement on the on the label as Monge had been used to doing already but the discussion had come up several times because we had been asked questions as to why we don't put the age on the bottle and more and more we realized the reason why we shouldn't do that because when you put an age statement on the bottle then it becomes the age of the youngest rum in the bottle but sometimes the addition of a younger rum helps with creating balance and character in the product and so uh, we took a conscious decision there and then to always avoid putting an age statement on the on the bottle even when we produced a, a product that was a one particular age right. a one particular age and a very very high level of maturity we didn't put the age on the on the bottle either we'll come to that later and that was right. when we were celebrating 300 years right so when and, we'll, and we're going to come back to that but so when you started what were the sort of the flagship mountain gay expressions at that time so at that time we had um, Eclipse rum, which everybody knows that was a flagship product. But then there were other rums that were a little bit uh, cut above the Eclipse in terms of quality. There was something called uh, Final Liqueur, which had a slightly greenish label. There was some, and it had a higher percentage of pot still rum. There was also a product called uh, Special Reserve rum, which had an, e an even higher percentage of, of of uh, pot still rum and there was sugarcane brandy which had the highest percentage of, of pot still rum aged pot still and matured pot still rum which made it have the character of brandy if you will uh, but we didn't have any particular expression that would that would uh that one would associate with with premium really high premium quality well throughout the world of course mount gay was seen as a premium brand so it didn't matter whether it was, the, whether it was Eclipse or, or uh, Special Reserve or what have you, Mongay was regarded all over the world at that time as a premium brand. Uh, it was well known as a premium brand. But for us at Mongay, we felt that we needed to step it up a bit more uh, so that we could line up well with other Caribbean producers who were in fact producing and packaging and labeling so that when you looked at it, you knew it was a premium brand. So what was the transition? Was there some sort of moment or reason why Mount Gay sort of transitions to a new set of expressions? Yes. Uh, when McKesson sold their shares in, 20, in uh, 1990 to Remy Martin, Remy, uh, but first of all, we had in the background created a product and it was kind of what you will call skunk work. Skunk work, 
in that we were doing it quietly. This is uh, myself and the operations manager at the time because I was in charge of quality assurance, but we had we had uh, an operations manager, Wallace Edinburgh, and Wallace felt that we needed to have a premium brand. So we set about creating a premium brand in terms of its organoleptic qualities. And so we, we did that and we finished that in in 1989, before the company was sold to to uh, to Remy Martin, we presented it to Remy Martin, and not Remy Martin, sorry, to, to McKesson before they sold the company, and they said, "No, we don't want to go with that. Scrap it." So we scrapped it. Scrapped it only in theory, but it was there. It was yeah. there still. Uh, we simply didn't launch it. And then in 1990, when uh, Remy came, we pulled it back out, dust, blew the dust off and said, look, this is a product that we were creating um, to be what we wanted to, to, to present as a premium, more premium that we currently have to match up with other premium brands that were already being created with, by other Caribbean companies. And they said, of course, let's do that. And they did tastings, they loved it. And they said, let's, let's run with it. Okay. And that product was extra old, which was launched in um, in 1992. Okay. So beyond that, uh, I understand that you got to do a very special extra old blend or a very special blend even older than that. Can you tell us about that? Yes. Well, in 2003, we were celebrating 300 years of rum blending uh, at the Mont Gay distilleries. Uh, um, uh, the story the story goes that that the oldest record dates back to 1703 but but it was clear to us that that there had been rum being produced on the Montgay properties well before that but there was no documented evidence of it the, the nearest documented evidence was a title deed which showed that uh, that there was equipment and a running and a factory running producing rum in uh, in 1703 so we celebrated uh, 300 years of rum making in the year 2003. We thought that we would launch, we would have a limited edi edition product to celebrate that. So we produced what we call, what we at the time called tricentennial rum, it's really tricentennial product, but it's a tricentennial uh, expression, which was 30 years old. It has some 34 year old rum in, as, rum in it as well, but, but we didn't put a label on it. And this is what it looked like. I don't know if any of our guests, our participants would remember this bottle, but this was being retailed at 300 US a bottle. We only produced uh, 3,000 bottles back then. Mm -hmm. uh, so, and every bottle was, was numbered. And so it was, it's, it's sold like hot cakes. Um, some people bought it by the case, mm -hmm. um, but as I said before, that rum was 30 years old minimum, and we still refused to put an age on the on the on the bottle. Uh, what what we were going for was was authenticity in terms of age. I had a bit of a challenge with it because as a blender, I thought that we needed to include some of the younger rums to give it more balance because this particular rum is very tannic in nature. It's very, very dark, naturally dark and tannic. So you feel and the astringency, astringency of the tannates on the tongue. Um, and to me, it is, while it is enjoyable, and I know that many connoisseurs like authenticity and they like um, to, to be able to, to see what the, what the rum is naturally from the barrel, which is what this is, uh, except that is it is diluted 40% alcohol by volume. But for me as a purist when it comes to rum character and balance and texture i like to throw some some other ages of rum in there to, to balance it out but i was asked not to do that at the time so it, it is what it is uh that's probably why you haven't finished this bottle i haven't <laughs> i still have it <laughs> right because while it is good in terms of of the romance of real uh maturity and age uh, it is not for me the, the 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 best in terms of balance and texture that a rum should have. So it is authentically 
30 years old with no kind of, of blending uh, except for how we combine the, the, the pot still rum and the single distillate to give it the character that it currently has. So that rum would have been distilled in 1972 or 1973 then? Yes. Okay. Yes. And, and can you share approximately the ratios of pot to column still? No. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you, have, you always have your secrets. Okay. That's a secret. That's a secret. <laughs> it's a secret. Yes. Yeah. No. Um, and actually, sort of a, a, a un unanticipated question. But at that time, those the rums that were that Mount Gay was aging at the time were they the fairly standard? Put it in, a, in an X X whiskey barrel and, and let it go, or was there any other sort of special barrels at play at that time? Well, there were there were a number of things that that were being done at the at, at the uh, at Mount Gay distilleries at the time. We we had um, sherry barrels, we had bourbon barrels, and so at the time, Mongay had a combination of sherry and um, and bourbon barrels. Okay. But then after a while, uh, but the per percentage of sherry barrels being used was, was quite small. And after a while, it became difficult to get those barrels. We were importing uh, barrels from Spain, and it became more and more difficult to get those barrels. So we, we, we focused on the bourbon barrels only. Um, when we came up with the extra old though, because we were already um, working with, um, when we launched the product with Remy, uh, we started doing some experimentation with, um, with, with the cognac barrels uh, so that, so that you, you may find that there are some elements of uh, limousine oak in uh, extra old. Okay. So we've talked about the the extra old and the blends or blends that you sort of brought brought into creation during that time your time there. Yes, uh, actually, when Remy took over, uh, this is before we launched the extra old. They rationalized the range that we had. They thought that the range that we had was was too great, so we stopped producing well first of all this they stopped with the final liqueur they stopped us from pr producing the the special reserve rum um and they wanted to focus just on eclipse and chicken brandy still at the time um and of course the new expression the extra old and they had asked me to reformulate the sugar cane brandy so that it it was not so close to Eclipse. So they wanted something that was dis distinctly uh, different from Eclipse. So what we ended up with was a product that was soft in texture, softer in texture than Eclipse. Uh, it was a bit more smoky than Eclipse. The smoked notes comes from the, the charring, the charring of the, the charred barrels that we use. And it had more, it had more notes of sugarcane, uh, reminiscent of sugarcane. If you pass and you ever uh, smell a sugar cane factory at work, you get those those whiffs and hints of, of uh, aroma coming from a sugar factory. So we built that into the, into the product at the time. And so we had a product there for that was no longer brandy in character, but more uh, sugar cane in character with some smoked notes. And that was, that's what sugar cane brandy became. We didn't change the name of the, of the product. Interestingly, we kept the name uh, sugar cane brandy. And as you would know, uh, sugarcane brandy is a, a, a name that would only work in Barbados and the rest of the Caribbean, but the moment you, you attempt to export to the United States or to Canada or to Europe, we had to call it sugarcane rum. Right. Yeah. I, I know there's a lot of confusion about this I, on the, the rum forum. You see people like, what's, you know, maybe got an old bottle. What's this? Is it, is like, what is this? Is it cane juice rum? Yeah. Yeah. So I, I thank you for sort of elaborating more on that. Yeah. Um, and actually, I actually can't remember, um, I'm just thinking out loud, were you involved with the creation of, of uh, Black Barrel? Black Barrel? No, Black Barrel came out after he left. But you, okay. you would notice that Black Barrel had many of the same characters. But anyone who was used to the reformulated sugar cane brandy will have noticed a lot of similarities between Black Barrel and sugar cane 
and and the reformulated sugar cane brandy they had much of the same notes there was a bit more that was done with it i believe i wasn't there so i can't say for sure but i will say generally speaking the characteristics were pretty much the same okay excellent so you left mount as i understand it you left mount gay around 2005 and then came back in yeah. around 2012 yeah right before remy Quantro purchased the rum refinery as well yes um tell us about your departure and subsequent rejoining well uh i had decided that after 25 years be before i got to 25 years of of service at mount gay i had decided that i wanted to try something new um so i did make applications for a number of other places nothing to do with rum <laughs> right interestingly because i wanted to hone my skills as a manager as well because i had done management uh training and qualifications in in operations management in uh, management accounting and finance as well as in industrial relations uh, so i i majored in three areas of management so i, I just wanted more opportunity to, to see how could i apply these to other companies that 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 are that were not that depending on my knowledge and expertise in rum for me to to manage uh, so i went on to work with a pharmaceutical company called bioville it's a canadian company but the owner um, the chairman of the company lived in barbados and i remember applying for that job when it was about to go on a cruise Northern Caribbean cruise uh, that would pass through Mexico. But I applied and I explained to them that I was going to be on a cruise and I would check back in when I returned. And on my return, um, I got a message from the HR company, the recruitment company, saying that the, that the company had already completed its, its interviews. Um, and I said, OK, but I, I did mention that I was going to be away. So did they, did they hire someone? They said, no, they, they found no one. I said, okay, well, can I still have an interview? They said, well, you would be willing to come for an interview tomorrow? <laughs> so, so I said, sure. And so I went for an interview and I ended up working in the pharmaceutical business as a director of supply chain and commercial operations. Um, the job application was really, the job that was advertised for the company was really manager supply chain but when they realized the kind of experience i had had at mount gay and the level at which i operated at mount gay they sort of upped the the responsibilities of the job and, and instead of being a manager i became a director okay so so that was your departure so then what brings you back to mount gay in 2012 so that pharmaceutical company which merged with an american pharmaceutical company called valiant uh, pharmaceutical Inc. Um, decided to split the company up into three parts. One was the operations, which they moved out to Ireland. Part of it was the intellectual property, which they moved to uh, Bermuda. And the third part of it was financial management finance, uh, which they moved out to Luxembourg. So, so they split the company up into, into three parts. And I wasn't going to be going off to Ireland for the operations part of it. You called there. <laughs> That's right. That's right. But uh, but we had already been working closely with a branch of the company in Ireland and that were reporting to, into me at the time. And so they started recruiting for someone to 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 work the Irish the I Ireland part. So they move everything over to that part of Ireland. And, and so at the same time that they were shutting shop here in Barbados. Uh, one of my colleagues, a Canadian who worked in the office right next to me, came over to my office and said, Jerry, your old job at Mount Gay is available again. Operations manager. I said, oh, really? Uh, so because when I left Mount Gay, I was, was operation, still master blender, but operations manager. That's the, the management part of it. Uh, so I went back to my old job as operations manager in 2012, um, which was the 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 time when the pharmaceutical company moved moved out they moved out at the end of august 2012 i picked up my position at mount gay um at the beginning of august 2012. okay and were you involved in the sort of this uh, eventual sort of sale of mount gay to uh, the of the rum refinery to to remy Quantrell? yes but only to the extent of evaluating the equipment that they had 
accounting for the various items of equipment that they had because when when Remy uh, threw Mount Gay Distilleries because it's, the sale was to Mount Gay Distilleries Limited and not to Remy uh, Remy Quantro it was to Mount Gay Distilleries okay. and uh, it was my job at that time to to go and evaluate look at the equipment evaluate it make a list of all the equipment that they had at the time so the, the sale was a, a, the, a, the purchase of the property and the equipment not the company itself Okay. So, so the company continued under a different name because we also bought the rights to the name Mount Gay. Okay. And so the company uh, continued under a different a different name uh, and in a different place, whereas the equipment and the lands that okay. uh, properties that they held and buildings uh, were bought by Mount Gay Distilleries Limited. Oh, okay. Interesting. I, I I somehow did not realize that it was that the, the rum refinery was sold to Mount Gay rather than to Remy directly. Um, interesting. Yeah. So um, you mentioned you mentioned master blenders. So you played a role in two subsequent uh, in, the, in the careers of two subsequent Mount Gay master blenders, Alan Smith and Trudy Ann Branker. Can you tell us about about you know your your involvement with them? Well, first, Alan Smith. Uh, he had been recruited to work with me while I was the quality assurance manager. He was recruited to me to to run all the technical stuff uh, in the lab, the analyses and so on. And we had bought a gas chromatograph. So his job was to also run the, the GC uh, machine and to do all of the, the lab lab work uh, that, you know, more more involved lab analyses that, that we had. Um, but during that time, um, I worked closely with Alan to get him also involved in organic analysis uh, assessment of, of the various maturities and ages of, of products uh, so that he would be able to, 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 to do like I was able to do, um, tell how old a particular rum in the barrel was simply by smelling and tasting it. And when I, said, when I say old, I mean maturity rather than age because age and maturity do not always line up. Sometimes you have rum that has been sat in a barrel for 10 years and it has only matured to about seven years. And the, the, it can happen the other way around too. Sometimes if you, depending on how you have defined your maturities, you may have a barrel of, of rum that has set, sat for only three years, but it has a maturity of five years. Uh, we see that happen uh, very often. That happens quite often. Right. So so uh, he learned from me how, how to do that and then how to formulate the various blends and so on. So he got more involved in the actual blending operation as I had done many, many years before that. So he, he sort of segued from being uh, the person who was a quality assurance technician and working in the lab, just doing analyses to being actually involved in the blending and aging processes. And so eventually when I was, when I left the company in, in 2005, he was quite ready and capable of taking over from there. And this is what Alan came up with. Oh, seventeen oh three. Yes, this this is Alan's creation. Ah, uh, okay. I've I've never owned a bottle. I've had it. I've never owned a bottle, but I need to fix that. <laughs> yes. Um, and so that was Alan. And then so Alan, the role of Master Bender became not just a marketing role where the Master Bender will go and travel all over the world to teach sales and distribution people about rum and how rum is made and Mongerum in particular and to teach them the, the nuances and differences, distinct differences between Mongay and any other rum, uh, the role of Master Blender really became a role of Master Blender. And so Alan then was no longer involved in quality assurance from the standpoint of working in a lab. Uh, although he did have his own lab at St. Lucie this after the purchase was made and we, we, Mongay owned the property up there, a particular lab, Master Blender's lab was created uh, for him in that role. And so he was focused mainly on developing new products, improving existing products, and signing off, being in the final sign off on all products that were made. So while we had quality assurance manager, we also had a master blender who, when it came to, to smell and taste profiles, would be the one to say, okay, this is good. This is good to go. Right. And it was important for, for the company to do that because then as the signature of approval was what became necessary and it became a more authentic way of recognizing the role of the master blender in the company. Okay. Um, and after Alan retired, 
uh, Trudian took over the role as master blender, and now she is doing just what uh, Alan was doing before. Alan um, left, though. Trudian had been serving as our quality assurance man uh, manager. I, we kind of stole her from uh, another local company, Pine Hill Dairy, um, that produces, you know, fruit juices and and as well as milks and so on and so forth. But she was the quality she was the quality control quality assurance manager there, there and we saw the value in having her at Montgomery and she quite uh, willingly accepted our offer to, to come and work with us and so she started off again and you've made the point before as as from her stamp from her knowledge of chemistry and biology as our as our uh, quality control uh quality assurance manager and then she segued into into the role of a master blender okay and is it true to say that you hired both of them? Yes. Okay, so, okay. That's true. Yeah. So I guess that's that's true. If I, if you have a long, long running company with a legacy, part of your job is to hire your successor. <laughs> that's right. Yes. So, um, what were your biggest challenges and greatest triumphs, if you will, of of your time as a master blender? Start with the challenges. <laughs> well, the challenges uh, really had to do with ensuring that we had consistent quality from from year to year, that whatever we produced today, 10 years from now, what we produce 10 years later is exactly the same quality as what we produced 10 years before, right? And for that purpose, uh, we developed uh, the what, what we call the triangle test. Um, I don't want to get too technical into what that, that involves. Um, I think many of the the master blenders who from other companies who may be on this call our quality assurance persons who are on this call may very well know what i'm talking about but it was just a question of having three samples in front of you where we what, that is why we say triangle test uh two of the two of them are the same and one is different and it is a two-tailed statistical test so that you have to have a certain number of tasters or trials because one taster could could, could taste more than once through the course of it period of time for, for a particular test. Um, but the minimum number of, of trials to be able to establish significance is a test of significance uh, was to be able was uh, five. You couldn't you couldn't do it with less than five tasters or five trials. Um, but of course the more tasters you have or the more tr trials you had, the more confidence you would have in the results of the test of the taste test. So you didn't have to be and the good thing about that test is that, that the tasters did not have to be experts. In fact, the best tasters are the ones that you just pull off the street for a test like that. Right. Because they come with no preconceived notions. Right. All we want them to do is to tell us if they, if they can tell a difference in smell and or taste as they compare these three samples. Right. right? Um, so that that really turned out to be quite, quite a challenge in the beginning, uh, especially trying to get the number of tasters tasters required <laughs> to mm -hmm. do that test. Separate that from other distil other distilleries. They also mm -hmm. like grab their forklift driver. And grab yeah. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It seems a common thing that you, you see in the Caribbean uh, rum That's true. That's true. Well, but even in the from even in the margarine business, which is where I went to work after I retired from Montgomery, we had the same challenge mm -hmm. trying to get enough tasters to taste uh, margarines. You know that we that we produced when I was working uh, when it was the operations manager for the margarine company so it doesn't matter what industry it is it's always hard to get a poor set of tasters who come readily to do the tasting right, right and your and your greatest joys of being a master blender oh the ability to to travel uh because as I mentioned to, uh, before I got to travel as far afield at that time as um Paris Scotland England Hawaii to, uh, of, of course, I traveled to New York quite a lot and to Miami quite a lot because we had uh, a very large distribution company in the United States who were always asking for the master blender to come out to train their staff uh, to do a better job in terms of selling and promoting the product. So traveling was, was quite a joy. Uh, another great joy for me was the awards won by the products that we produced especially for extra oil because we entered the uh, extra oil in the Monde Selection competition annually. 
and I would win gold every time we entered it. And at one point, we won three consecutive um, goals. And uh, after winning three consecutive goals, you are awarded a grand gold medal. And uh, so Mongolia has, uh, the extra world has achieved grand gold. And so I went to Brussels to, to receive that on the company's behalf. So there's been some, some, some good, really interesting and exciting points in, in the history of Mongolia and my role as master blender. So is there, you know, sort of inside baseball, is there some sort of a secret master blender society where you get together and trade notes and drink each other's rums, anything at if, all like that? If there is, I'm yet to find it, you know? <laughs> I mean, I'm a member of all kinds of secret societies. I don't like to call it that, you know, as a Freemason. Um, um, and so that's, that's the only secret society that I'm a, a member of, but for master blenders, it would be good to have a society of master blenders. Oh, yeah, true. But I, assu I assume, do you, do you ever get together with Alan or Trudy just to talk talk shop or compare notes and stuff like that? No, we haven't done that yet because um, there, may, there may be a slip. So, you see, be, being no longer in the company, it is not easy for them to talk to me about things that are happening. Uh, um, true. Because yeah. they are sworn, like I was, to secrecy. Uh, true. Fair point. Fair point. <laughs> so, um, from your perspective, how have consumers' taste in rum changed over the past 30 years or so from when you, or 40 years ago even, when you started? Like, have you noticed consumer taste in rum shifting? And and if so, like, how has that changed maybe how you would formulate rums? Yeah, I, I think we've noticed a change. And uh, the marketing uh, experts will tend to, to see that more readily than I would, uh, but what? And so when, uh, when a master blender creates a product, he creates a product, product guided by what the sales and marketing people are saying, uh, what the trends are, and therefore we should go in this direction and this is the kind of product that we want. Uh, the company made a mistake many, many years ago when I was a master blender, when I was in charge of quality assurance of, of coming out with a, a white rum uh, without any insight from a study in the field and at that time the local market was not ready for Mongolia to be a white rum producer we actually did <laughs> to, to understand why is it that this white rum is not taken off because we had done the create the product development we had done tastings of using white rum the 200 white rum drinkers in barbados who frequent the shops and your know, slam dominoes and that kind of thing we you know we, we invited them to come to our facility and to blind taste some white rums that we were working on and we were comparing those white rums with their favorite white rums which at the time was alinata white white rum esa fields was also a local brand but it was not at the time as popular as alinata white rum but we had that in there as well and hands down they preferred mongay mongay's new white rum and at that time we called it premium white the, the name of the brand was premium white and so it, it had all of the trappings of a product that was that should do very very well because the the rum the white rum drinkers of barbados loved it and we, not only did we bring the white rum drinkers of barbados but we brought the the opinion leaders among white rum drinkers so we know we knew that they would push the brand right and so but although we did that and launched the product, it didn't do very well. The sales did not go the way we expected. We did a focus group study afterwards. And what came back from the focus group was Montgay is not a white rum producer. Montgay is an aged quality rum producer. So the public did not accept the idea. Oh, it was more psychological than anything. It had nothing to do with quality. It had everything to do with the perception of the customer, right. the, the consumer. So that didn't work very well. But subsequent to that, though, Mongay did, did, did try his hand at this. Okay. This this was an Alan Smith creation, too. A vanilla flavored uh, white rum. Okay. Uh, slightly, slightly sweet. He also did this. This was a mango flavored okay. white rum. And again, and that, that was many, many years after 
the first way rum attempt failed, but this was an attempt at a flavored way mm -hmm. rum because we, we we saw that flavored vodkas were were coming on stream and we, we figured we could revisit the idea of a white rum, but this time no flavored white rum. Right. That didn't work out very well either, mm -hmm. right? So um, I guess I'll back away from the whole idea of producing a white rum, whether flavored or not, because we had already learned that the consuming public did not want to see Mongay produce white rum. Right. It's interesting. Like I've noticed uh, across many of the large Caribbean producers that they are sort of splitting their brands and having their premium brands sort of retain the legacy name, but having sort of like with a more budget friendly or flavored being a separate brand, maybe to help consumers accept it more. Do um, you think that helps or what are your thoughts on that? Well, we, I've never tried that. We, Monge has never tried that because Monge has always been very proud of, of its logo right. and its name. So Monge has never thought to, to do just that, except for this. We don't, we don't have the map of Barbados on this one. Okay. Uh, this is the only product that Monge had produced that did not have, but back in the day, that did not have the, the map on it, that did not have the look, right? We had a completely different look. And even when we did this one, this one is an eight year old special reserve as i said before we had stopped producing this but this is probably the last of a batch of special reserve rum mm -hmm. this one is very high uh, uh, highly intense in in um pot still rum okay. and blended with column still rum aged eight years old, aged okay. eight years old. Uh, and, but we used to do this around christmas time when christmas was coming around we would produce a few a few bottles every christmas uh, but of course, that, that went the way of the dodo birds mm -hmm. when when, uh, when we decided not to be producing those other side side products anymore. Right. Um, that's, that leads me actually to another question that just popped into my head is um, Barbados rum is traditionally known as being just sort of the exquisite blend of pot and column still rum. Um, but there are countries like Jamaica where there's sort of strong preference for a, a pot still rum. Um, is there something particular to the, you know, Barbadian drinking palate that sort of lends towards wanting blends rather than, you know, like a heavier pot still only rum? I am not too sure that that, that is the case. I know that, that Barbadian uh, drinkers, especially those who consider themselves to be connoisseurs and to be true traditionalists in the sense of these aged colored rums that I've just shown you here, where it is not too heavy on the pot still um and it is more single distillate but they like the flavor of that the pot still brings uh, but the modern drinker tends to be moving towards all kinds of of expressions right now uh, you mentioned you mentioned earlier uh, the modern drinker and so what is happening now is that there's a far more flexibility in the modern drinker so when you look at people who are between the ages of 20 and 35 years old say uh they are they are more forgiving and more, more uh, uh, very very willing to try new things so when we talk about the barbadian drinker i think i think we have to be also cognizant of the age groups that we are talking about and so the younger drinkers are more uh interested in adventure and exploring new new things right um, but you know trinidad rums and jamaican rums uh and Barbados rums are not that different. Uh, they all tend to be dry in terms of blending, so you don't get a lot of sweet, perfumey character like you would get, for example, on South American continent, uh, including Guyana. Those mm -hmm. rums on the whole of the South American continent are very perfumey, uh, much of it because they, they may be using quite high levels of fossil rum, as we mentioned before. Uh, I think a lot of fruit curing still takes place. And so you get a lot of those aromatic notes coming from the fruit curing. Um, so and so, it is on that continent that we tend to find a big difference between what we do in the English speaking Caribbean, except Guyana, uh, and, and, and what happens on that, uh, right. on that continent. Right, yeah. I mean, there's there's been a lot of observations uh, that Barbados rums in particular now nowadays in the last five years have gained a lot of popularity with like the bourbon crowd, bourbon drinkers. They mm -hmm. notice those similar notes that they get from bourbon, 
uh, and the dryness they, they experience uh, in Barbados rum as well. Right. Yes. Um, I will, we will expect that from, from bourbon drinkers. And as a matter of fact, when the extra oil was created, it was created with the idea of attracting the bourbon drinker, uh, the Scotch whiskey drinker as well, and to some extent, uh, the cognac drinker. Because when we did blind tastings with persons who whose favorite was was um, was bourbon, they liked the extra oil. They preferred the extra oil when tasting like blindly against um, bourbon. When we did tastings with Scotch drinkers, they preferred the extra oil when tasted blindly against Scotch. And when when we did that with cognac drinkers, the same thing happened. Right. Sure. Preference was for the preference was for the extra oil. In fact, there were some executives from Remy, whom before we actually launched the extra oil came, uh, we we put them to do a blind a blind test in our tasting room, uh, and the blind test involved extra oil and their favorite Remy cognac. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, we had a, a range. Of, we have we had the Remy XO. We had uh, the VSO P and the extra oil and they all chose the extra oil so there was a there, there was something about the extra oil that appealed to them more than than their favorite drink did right so it, it told us that that the the idea of making a rum that would fit all those that wide profile of of tastes worked right right and, and hearing that story makes me very glad that I still have about half a bottle of extra hold from 2013. So I'm <laughs> going to hang on to that. Yeah. Um, so sort of jumping ahead a little bit more in your career, since you left Mount Gay, uh, you have coordinated with Worspa uh, to assist other Worspa distilleries. Uh, tell us about that. So uh, when I... Um, finally resigned, uh, not resigned, retired from, from Mount Gay in 2015. Uh, Worspa, Von Renwick, uh, Renick, he, 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 he pronounced his own name differently than I've been pronouncing it all these years. I've always been saying Renwick. And he, and, yeah. and he, but then he mentioned his own name in, in some reference recently. And he said, did you say Renick? So Von called me up and said, uh, Jerry, would you be willing to come and work with us as a consultant to you know, help other rum companies throughout the region um, with their production and their products and so on and so forth? I said, absolutely, because that's that's my life. That's what I love to do. So I'd be more than willing. So we did that. And uh, during that time, uh, we did I did three companies. I did a company in Suriname, one in Belize, and one in Grenada, where we did product, product improvements. Uh, uh, process improvements and so on and so forth. Okay, so um, we're going to guess. So Suriname, I would get would have to be Suriname alcoholic beverages. Um, uh, is it Grenada um, would I'm going to guess uh, Grenada Distillers, or either Grenada Distillers or or uh, River Antoine. Well, I don't want to call any names, but okay. But, okay. Uh, <laughs> okay. Well, there's only there's only a few. We, we we can hazard a guess. All good. All good. Um, speaking of Vaughn, he had he had a question up here. He says, "My perception is that the release of Extra Old was a game changer for Barbados rum, drawing in many new drinkers who previously had been whiskey drinkers, which we talked a little bit about. I'd like to hear from Jerry about how he thought it was received." I'm not surprised to hear that. I don't know of a marketing study that that that. That identified that as being the case, but I will say this. In my early years at Mount Gay, whenever I went out to party, I would order Johnny Walker Black. Although I was producing rum, I was producing Eclipse rum, I was producing Sugar Cane Brandy, I was producing Final Liqueur, I was producing Special Reserve. But they were all quite young. Um, in terms of their maturity level and uh, i wanted something more than that so i would drink johnny walker black and i had friends and family who would say to me well what is what are you doing you work for a rum company and you are drinking mature sc scotch whiskey i said yes because this is my private thing i i enjoy this kind of flavor right so but i thought of that and 
And so actually when the Bendy Extra Oil was created, that's pretty much the thinking behind it, that it would appeal to a, to a Scotch drink. And I really wanted, wanted to be able to drink a rum that I was producing when I was uh, experience, when I was out partying elsewhere and I go to a bar, I want to be able to order Mount Gay. Mm. Uh, right? I mean, I could have done that before, but then it was not as enjoyable as what, as the Johnny Walker Black that he was drinking at the time. And it was not a very sophisticated drinker at the time, but I did want I did want the maturity level there, right? Yeah. Um, so I would not be surprised if it is true to say that many Scotch drinkers uh, transitioned to extra oil when extra oil was launched. Um, many came to me though, who were Scotch drinkers and told me that they've dropped Scotch and that they were now drinking um, the extra old so but that's not a, st a statistically significant right. match, uh, sample size so just a few people and when i asked them why they said because we were getting the very same quality that we like for less than half the price mm -hmm. <laughs> right and in fact there was one distributor who said to me when we, when we first launched extra old that we were giving away the product the price was too low yeah right because I, when we first la launched it we were selling it uh i think it was 15 dollars a bottle he felt that we should it should be somewhere in the 45 dollar range wow yeah. <laughs> uh, i agree i would have bought it all if i could get <laughs> that price so um one final question unless anybody else uh, pops in uh, before we wrap up here um do you have any thoughts on where Caribbean rum will go or should go over the next five or 10 years? I can say what I would like to say. Oops, we've lost him. Hold on, we're gonna see if Jerry can join us back in here. Um, or, or Fetty could come on and sing a song while we're waiting for, for Jerry. Oh, there he is. I'm sorry, I dropped off. Oh, good, good. All right. So as you were saying, you were talking yeah. about where rum should go. Yeah, I'd like, like 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 to see Caribbean rums continue their their emphasis on being premium for those um, consumers who love premium spirits. I'd like to see some flexibility around uh, other products that rums that are less serious. That are more for the the the, the, the fun loving younger younger group you know rums more like this i'd like to see that this kind of thing can, can now play a bigger role okay. in the caribbean and, and as a matter of fact i am working on a on a project right now uh which is looking at products like that which which will be um uh, flavored white rum okay Right, that brings different flavors uh, uh, to, the, to the public. So I'd like to see a little bit more flexibility there. That it's not all narrowly focused on on what we know, what we have known rum to be for all these years, but that we could introduce more of this for the younger drinker and, yeah. and introduce rums that are really um, good and, and and versatile for cocktail making because cocktail. Uh, but what I find is that mixologists, bartenders are always looking for something new, something different to try, something to, to spice up their, to spice right. up their their blends, their their cocktails. Mm -hmm. And so, if if we in the rum industry could do more of that kind of thing, where we do more fun stuff uh, with rum, and not not just see it as being the the age mature product that us, I, and I have to to count myself as one of those two who are who are purists when it comes to rum, and that rum could only be a rum. Uh, Confirm, con considered rum if it is aged for so many years and uh, acquired right. the amber color and these notes and so on. No, rum could, uh, rum is distilled in a still and it have different um, expressions that we could have and we could flavor them just like how we have the cognac, uh, not the cognac industry, the 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 um, vodka industry and others now playing with, with flavors as well. Right. Um, yeah, that, I mean that's a that's a very um, interesting perspective. I know uh, amongst the the super enthusiast ones who are buying the three hundred dollar bottles, there's the sort of almost disdain for flavored products because they feel like it's diminishing, you know, sort of giving a bad impression to people maybe coming into rum. 
Um, but but yeah, I, I agree. Like a, 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 com a company should be able to have a variety of products that suit a wide variety of, of taste. And it's just a matter of um, if you're going to elevate rum, you need to elevate rum and make it perceived as a premium product. You have to educate the consumer on, on what those distinctions are. So. That's it. That's that's good. Well said. Thanks. Thank you. All right. Uh, I don't see any more questions, so I think we're good. Um, Jerry, it's been an absolute pleasure to chat with you. Uh, I've learned a few things. Uh, I always learn a few things every time I do this, but uh, I want to thank you so much for coming on and sharing your uh, decades of experience with us. Um, any any last words you want to say before? Well, Patty comes on? well, first of all, I'd like to thank you very much, Matt, for having me on, on this particular series, the Icon series. Uh, I want to also thank uh, Vaughn for thinking of me for this series and the team at, at Worspo. I'd like to thank all of our, our um, participants who have joined the, the call uh, to, give up, to give up their time and attention to what we are doing here. I think uh, we can only improve uh, what we all do by sharing the, the knowledge that we have. So thanks again. Thank you. Freddie, take us out. <laughs>